Hi, everyone. It's 10 o'clock, so I thought we'd kick it off in a timely manner. And that way, I have only myself to blame if we tend to go over. Uh, my name's Tyler Bell. I'm the, uh, I run product at a company called Factual, based in LA. And Factual does a lot of geo things. Uh, formerly, in a former life, I used to run product for Yahoo, uh, Yahoo Geo. And um, I've, I've received many condolences about the product sunsetting uh, these days. Um, so thanks to everybody who said that. The obituary you're reading now is for a product that died many, many years ago. So, uh, but we're, we're all on to better things, I think. So the reason I'm here today is to talk. I'm in the geocoding session, and it's I'm just delighted that there's a like-minded number of freaks that really enjoy talking about geocoding. Um, I'm going to sort of uh, meander a little bit off and onto the subject again, and and my really my goal is twofold. One is I want to be both illustrative and I also want to make a point. So I want to talk about a kind of use case that you don't hear much about in these kinds of conferences, uh, and I also sort of want to drive home a point about basically machine inputs. And so I will have satisfied those goals if. At the end of this conversation, you take those two things away with you. Um, so the first thing that I want to acknowledge is that we all have, and I'm not going to get too meta here, but I think sort of establishing a, a foundational perspective is important. Um, we all have a different idea of what uh, mapping is. Um, for many folks, it's exactly what you see on the screen here. Uh, for many of us in this room, and certainly for many of us who started some time ago, this is what you think of when you think of mapping. Uh, and for others, it's this, this third option. And really, just to sort of be very clear, this is sort of where I come from. This is my vision of what mapping is right now, which is basically does not contain a map. It's very much about what happens to the data underneath. It's about joining data and it's about machine-to-machine -machine communications. Generally, the kind of mapping that I enjoy doing is that where humans are involved uh, only at the very end. And I say that, and I say that very explicitly, because it does affect how we think about geotechnologies, and it, thinks it, it affects how we think about mapping. So one of the key things that I, points that I make, because I really always start with a mobile phone, because um, you know, William Gibson's said that, uh, amongst many other things, he, ma he made the point that there's this idea of, uh, of cultural change. And William Gibson believes that all cultural change is actually driven by technology, and that if you don't have technology change, then cultural change ossifies. And I talk about, I, I sort of make that William Gibson reference in, uh, in context of the mobile phone is because we now have mobile phones, but a lot of us still map the same way. We still write vectors, we still digitize, we still create the same kind of information for the map in ways that we have for the last um, 10, 15 years, if not certainly longer. I tend to look on the, the, the mobile phone view, and so really that's the view that I'm, I'm bringing to you today, and I hope uh, I can introduce you to something that's, that's a little bit new. So generally, when maps and consumers and mobile users uh, combine when they meet, it's in the idea of a classic geofence. It's a real-time service that says, look, either on the device or on the server, it says, look, the user is here. Um, please tell me where here is, and then, allow, and then do something based on that knowledge. So in this traditional so-called classic geofencing use case, a user is at the event, uh, excuse me, the user is at the stadium, uh, then you do a temporal lookup, and it's see, you see that the stadium is actually having an event right now, and that event has certain attributes to it, and then an action is triggered. And in this case, that action is sort of serving some kind of notification to the user. Um, and I point, I point this out because it's something we're all familiar with, um, is this kind of geofencing. But what's implicit and usually not made explicit is the fact that what you're doing here is you are painting the user with information from the map. Um, and so generally within geofencing, we are, we are actually looking at how we can learn more about the user based upon where they are. And so whenever you hear talks about contextual relevance, geocontextual relevance, this is really what we mean, is how can we learn more about the user based upon where they are? 
And this is very important in a mobile world, so as the world moves off the desktop and parts of the world who never even reach the desktop and moves more onto mobile, you're moving away from things that allow a lot of the publishers, so app developers, publishers, website developers, to know who the users are. And so knowing who the users are is basically established through knowing your emails or doing cookie tracking. And these things don't exist or they exist in very different formats on mobile. So as the world moves on to mobile phones, there's this, a massive need to know who those consumers are, know who your users are for two reasons. One is to give contextually relevant content and personalize their mobile experience. And the second, of course, is um, to, to monetize them better. Uh, so I, my, my goal really is to start out by saying that, look, there is a dichotomy here. Uh, traditionally, what we're doing with Geo when we do things like geofencing is we, we are, uh, the user is being informed by the map. But what, also what I want to say is you're, we're beginning to see the makings of a very interesting virtuous circle whereby users are actually beginning to inform the map itself. And this is something that we don't see a lot of. Basically, user positions are being used to create and much more importantly, validate information on the map. And most importantly, it's underlying data. And one reason we don't hear this talked about, about sort of users and user location, is really because it tends to come in, in two flavors. One is probe data, and so basically point data coming off of cars which run on roads, and that's all very sort of well-conceived and knowledgeable. But also, when you're dealing with people who are traveling by foot, there's not a linear network there. Um, and so it's harder to make sense of that kind of information. Also, I think, and this is just sort of spitballing here, but I think that a lot of us, probably a lot of us of a certain age, uh, desperately moved the geospatial world out of a point-based environment into one that was vector and polygon-based and eventually into three dimensions. And therefore, the, I think that there's a slight anathema to just sort of one, you know, two, two dimensional points only and, being, uh, and, and validating that as a very real spatial resource. Um, but what we're seeing now within the mobile world is this idea of data exhaust. When it, whenever anyone engages with their mobile phone, usually uh, a geotag is recorded, and that's combined with a temporal tag as well. And so you've got this wonderful, very, very powerful combination of geo and temporal, um, which allows us to do some wonderful things that I'll, I'll talk about shortly. Um, what, and the, the, the good thing here that I want to highlight is that it's it's... Data exhaust is not a term that I favor, but it's one that's come about through these discussions of, of big data. And the idea is that as we go through our lives, which are increasingly digital, we create uh, um, metadata. And that metadata may not exactly relate to the task at hand. So for example, when I um, engage with my phone or I perform a local search, uh, that search engine will take my geolocation and it will process that in the search result, uh, but that geolocation still can remain on the server, and products and things can be built off of that server. So a, a, probably a, a better, if, if not a more cumbersome metaphor, is the idea of sort of taking nuclear waste and repurposing it as a secondary fuel, the idea of data exhaust. And really, because we are all carrying mobile phones around with us, uh, we collectively are creating a massive amount of geospatial and, and uh, temporospatial uh, exhaust. Uh, and we've been doing this for a while. So this is a slide that I used to show back in 2008. And what it is, it's uh, the idea here is that uh, Flickr users have, have geotagged, in this case manually geotagged, um, Hong Kong Airport on the photographs that they've taken. And then ver using various uh, approaches, you can actually build polygons out of these point clusters. And so this is what it looked like in 2008. And what, really what I'm highlighting here is the fact that, you know, even in 2008, we were already creating geometries out of, out of data that people contributed as part of the data exhaust. We are, we are improving the map through people. Um, this isn't, you may argue that this is not a very uh, accurate representation. One of the things that I find most interesting is down in the lower part of the slide there is the, is the runway. And there's no data there because that's where uh, 
um, passengers are told to turn off their devices, and so data gets wiped, and, and you don't see anything. But if you look at a later incarnation of that polygon, um, you can see not only is the data much richer, but also you can see um, that it's actually post-FAA regulations, and now we're actually capturing data. And you can see the landing strip at the top. We still don't have much data because people tend to turn their phones on when they land. Um, but you can see that the entire takeoff runway is covered in data because people still have their devices on and they either keep them on for the flight or, or turn them off usually when cell reception goes away. And so this is a slightly peripheral example of how individuals, people, and mobile devices are helping us create and understand and analyze data. Um, this is a much more traditional example. Uber tweeted this probably about three days ago, I think. Um, and this is traditional so-called probe data, right? So every uh, Uber driver's phone captures the driver's location as they drive through the street. And I think the fascinating thing here is that they're saying they're basically redrawing the map of New York City um, every five days. Is that what it says? It's refreshing it every five days. So. Um, Two things here. One is that um, gone are the days where it was difficult to make maps. Now and increasingly, this is really the first, not, not even the first, right? Waze did this donkeys years ago. But this is, this is a, a very, very handy example of the idea of data exhaust. Knowing where users are over time, the product, the business is to get your consumers from point A to point B, but in the process, we're actually building maps and building map data. And then we can buy Decarta and we can actually figure, use those guys to figure it out. But this is fascinating, not only because it's a perfect example of data exhaust, not only because it's an example of how much data is captured on an hourly by hourly basis, but also fundamentally because I, I think that it, it breaks our conceptions of there being a map or just a few maps. When many of us in this room started in Geo, it was sort of, you know, it was Nokia and it was TomTom Tom and a bunch of bit players and then Google came in, it was the Google map, uh, bought ways, sort of added to that. And really, we all expected this sort of massive consolidation to go down to just two or three players, the pundits in the industry. I think what you're seeing is actually in the same way that the sort of uh, galaxy expands and then collapses, I think you're actually seeing some elasticity there, is that businesses are now capturing so much geo as part of what they do whenever they get engaged with consumers that they are creating this kind of data and this kind of information. And the question is, what, what folks like Uber are not going to surrender this. They're not going to give this to anyone, let alone OSM. But others will, uh, and others have. And so one of the questions to us as a community, of course, is what do we want to do with this kind of information? The question isn't necessarily, is that going to go into our map? Uh, the question is, it's going, into, it's going into a map, and other maps are being made. Do we want to take advantage of it? Um, within the idea of local search and marketing, and I'm getting into some sort of gray areas here. You don't hear, hear a lot about search and marketing, thank goodness, at this conference. Uh, but the reason I mentioned it is because it's, it's, it's a wonderful source, both the marketing side and the ad tech side for data. And this is where I'm sort of, inter this is where it, the tangents are touched on the geocoder side. So this is from a, a glossy publication that uh, Google produced. And they're basically just pointing out, amongst many other things about how great they are, that um, searches about where I am have increased um, 34x since 2011, which is a, a, a fantastic number. Um, so increasingly, and this, this is funny, I think that the geo world naturally is one where there are inherent contradictions. So one contradiction in the geo world is we're actually moving physically into the third dimension. Drones are now capturing data from three dimensions, um, and we're sort of moving into the third person, and people are beginning to paint their logos on their buildings because it's going to be captured not by just microsatellites, but drones too. As the world is moving into the third person, the map is shrinking. It's becoming more, much more first-person centric as well. People are saying less about sort of what's around here or let me get me from A to B. It's much more what's around me. And traditional local search is designed to get the consumer to the pizza or the sushi. 
Increasingly, that kind of local search is now, I don't know who the user is. Let me understand where they go over time so I can learn about the user, and I'll talk about that a little bit now. But just, just, just some general numbers about who is using geotargeting and geosearch. So coming back to my earlier point, this is not just about mapping. It's really about geotechnologies. It's about using consumer-based intelligence about who is doing what to help us improve uh, data and also understand who the user is. Um, and the biggest source of this, of course, is applications. Generally, we refer to those as publishers, but think app developers, right? So one of the, the um, critical points is that whenever you uh, have an app, and usually sort of ad tech, one reason I say it's sort of a, a, a dark word, and maybe I should have said a trigger warning for the younger folks in the audience. But the reason that ad tech is particularly interesting is because it is such an incredibly rich data stream. Many of us dismiss it because, oh, it's ad tech, you know. Mm. But it's a massive data source because every app that wants to monetize through ads, uh, many of them will put attached geo to the bid requests. So when they say, look, I want somebody to pay money to show, me, sh to show my audience an ad here, I'm going to tell you everything I can about the ad and about who the person is, and very often that's geo. So if you look at mobile exchanges where mobile ads are bought and sold, um, you see sort of a 35 or 40 percent mark with high precision geo, and that's growing, I don't know, let's say it's sort of 8 to, to 14 percent per annum based on the exchange. The takeaway there is that more and more people are pushing high precision geo data through the RTB, the real-time bidding exchange pipes. And that's just a wonderful resource for learning about uh, people, learning about the map. And what Factual does is we basically validate that data and then build on top of it. So um, here's an example of a bad app. Generally, you see um, it, one, of, one of the fascinating things is that uh, when, when geopoints come down the, the RTB pipe, they're not attached to your application. Many of us who develop in mobile apps, there's a, a complete chain of custody where the user location is sourced on your app and then it's sent down to your servers for your analysis. In the RTB world, in the advertising world, it's sourced, you don't know how, it just comes to you. It's been stripped naked of all its metadata. And so you're left with this timestamp and this coordinate and you have to figure out, well, what, you know, is this good and can I use it to build my models about people and places? Uh, and this is an example of data that you, you, you can't use. So a lot of apps just sort of make stuff up. And these, you, you do analyses, and you can learn that pretty darn quickly. Um, that's compared to the actual good guys who look like this. And of course, you're using geo, you're using maps, you're using the vectors, just you know, basic stuff to, to ensure what data is good and what data is bad. A slightly more interesting example is this one where an app, it's not the app, it's the developer. So in the previous one, you could say that it's actually where you saw them all in the North Sea, all the points. You could say that's a fraudulent app. They're just throwing geodate in there and attempting to monetize without actually asking the user for permission. Here, they've asked the user for permission to use their, their geolocation. They're using it to serve an ad, but the developers flipped the longitude and the latitude. And so you can see that the red point is actually where it is as far as the app is concerned. But if you turn them around, it's, it, it ends up very, very nicely in uh, Buenos Aires there. So um, using the map, again, to understand these coordinates, and you can actually post-process these things to figure out where users actually really are, and you can improve the quality of their bid and improve the quality of app monetization. Um, but really, one of the most interesting, interesting things, those are sort of interesting examples, I think, about how geo is being used in real time, and it's not just point and polygon. You can't do it at that kind of volume. You've got to have sort of other tricks. But one thing that you're seeing now as an emerging technology is this idea of place attachment. And it goes by different names. It goes as sort of place snapping, place attachment. It goes as uh, um, uh, point capture, for example. And what this is, it's saying, look, I have a data point and I have a time point. I need to know about this user. Tell me which business this person is associated with now. So that's all I give you is just the point and then the, uh, and the time. And I need to know what business this user is in because if they're in the dry cleaner there or they're in the uh, uh, lawyer's office there, those are very two different inferences that I can draw about the user. And so there's a basically a, 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 the technology 
has been around for a while that folks are doing this, but you're now seeing APIs exposed publicly that allow us to, to third parties to access this stuff as well. So Factual does a lot of this in the background. This is just an example of one of our test beds where we can look at points that come in, they can get annotated, they can get comment commentaries. You see all the other businesses that are nearby and then you build a probability matri matrix that says, hey, this user is actually in the in and out burger. And I know that because I saw him moving sort of two points to either side, and so I know it's sort of a quick stop. Um, you can look at the other businesses to see when they're open, the time of day. If you have a user ID, you can also look at behavioral patterns to actually match uh, the user to a specific business. So there is generally massive money and massive intelligence can be gained by understanding which businesses a user is con uh, associated with. And if you do s sort of simple sort of what's the nearest business, you're almost always going to get a wrong answer. Um, and the reason I'm highlighting this is twofold, really. One is, is to say, this is a, this is a kind of, um, basically it's reverse geocoding, right? You're saying, here's a point, you know, tell me about that point, except it's, it's not about the address, it's really about the place. Yes, I want that geographic context, but it's really that business, that POI. Um, and the other point is that, unlike traditional geocoding, or unlike things like what three words, the process here is to create machine-based models to build consumer profiles on, and therefore it's strictly machine-to-machine -machine communication rather than machine-to-consumer communication. And so traditionally, you don't have the 10 blue links that the user disambiguates. The machine has to say, this is, these are the businesses that user could be associated with at any given time, and here are the probabilities against each one and then the, the machine that consumes that basically puts that into a pile and just looks at all the user data over days and weeks and months and actually begins to learn a little bit about who that user is. So Google is doing something like this. They have a place uh, disambiguation API. This came out with the latest Android release. Um, and uh, Foursquare, um, I'm not from Foursquare, obviously, and there's better people in this room to talk to Foursquare about, but I highlight it because this is sort of their bread and butter. They've been doing this for donkey's years, um, and this is sort of what their point cloud looks like. <clears throat> and that point cloud is basically where the devices say the phone is compared to where the, the place they're checking into actually is. And so whenever, certainly whenever I'm looking for data that factual can source, I'm always very interested in data that has that kind of delta, where there's a disambiguated place, and the user is saying, I am here at this place, and, but the, the phone might be telling them something different. And it's a great way to develop sort of crowdsourced geocodes for places, but it's also a great way to actually build these point clouds that, that, that allow you to, to enhance your probability matrices. Um, so one, one perfect example of this is the recent release of Uber. So when you say, pick me up here, so in this example I've got uh, 405 Howard Street, and you say, pick me up at 405 Howard Street, your phone is recording a point that is at or near 405 Howard Street. It doesn't matter if you're a couple blocks away and you're hoping to meet the car there. The idea is that with enough points, and you're going to have, using Uber, it's going to be tens or hundreds of thousands of points at, at 405 uh, Howard that the cluster itself gives the shape of the actual venue and the shape of the entity. And so this is just a, a, another very interesting way, and it's sort of an emerging science, I think. It, it's not proximity search, it's not, uh, it's not pure disambiguation, it's actually trying to create those models about who people are based upon where they go. And so here's a perfect example of this. Basically, you're looking at device patterns, you're looking at repeat behaviors, where users go over time, where they return to, um, you're looking at different kinds of events, different kinds of venues, times of day, and this allows us to build models without knowing who these individuals are, allows you to build very nice demographic, geographic, behavioral, and re retail-based models on who they are, and the apps use that to personalize and monetize. So um, I've got two minutes left, and I'm going to creep into the question time a little bit, but uh, I was reading sort of as a, as a coda, I was reading a little bit about uh, this thing from Mike Dobson, and he was talking about crowdsourcing map systems. Um, and he says, basically, it's sort of how data gets passed back and forth until it's considered correct. How sort of a data entity or a knowledge sort of finds its natural resting place in a, in a cradle of truth. Um, uh, and, of course, he was commenting this on the, on the um, 
Android on the Google Map Maker issue, which I would hope everybody in this room is familiar with, where it was first announced that it was an Easter egg, but actually the map was getting ha hacked horribly. And one thing, one thing I found interesting about uh, Mike Dobson's parlance, and if you don't read Mike's uh, telemathics blog, I recommend you do, because he's very, very lucid. But he talked about how data in, in a crowdsourced environment gets passed back and forth between users, between us humans, until we settle on some kind of resemblance of truth. And he said it's much like a, like a ping pong game. He says it's kind of like a ping pong match, the way that the data goes back and forth. Um, I, I would say that actually what we want to see is something where it's more like a forge, because when you have a, a uh, when you play ping pong ball, the ball doesn't change as you hit it back and forth. But really what we do with data, when we move it, when we sort of have that community effort, we're changing the shape of the data until it actually resembles something that we share, a shared understanding of truth. And the reason I highlight this is to try to bring it full circle and say, look, what you're seeing here is that traditionally it's people that pass data back and forth to identify truth. Now that we're all carrying mobile phones, now that we have all of these apps coming to fruition, uh, now that the usage of geo in all of the data streams is only going up, if you think about the data being, being hammered between a hammer and an anvil, and that used to be two individuals, or usually a community of individuals. Really what you're looking at now is machine-generated data. Machine-generated data is the anvil against which we hammer our own understanding and local knowledge of geographic truth. And so I said I wanted to both introduce something and I wanted to sort of make a point as well. I hope that I've introduced the idea of RTB streams. I hope that I've introduced the idea of user location and the idea of place disambiguation, and I hope that's now on your mental radar. So when you, when you see it emerge, you can say, yes, I, I, I heard it first, it's state of the map. But I also want to say that, look, we, we as, an, as the OSM community are, and will be, continue to be foolish to reject the kinds of sensor inputs that we are seeing now across the globe. The mobile world is creating maps. They're creating thousands, if not uh, hundreds of thousands of maps. And the question is not, um, you know, do we want to take that data in, uh, really, but we really need to ask ourselves and say, look, other people are taking this kind of data in. Other kinds of maps are being created. How can we take better advantage of this kind of data, not only as it exists now, but fundamentally as it emerges in the coming years? So that's the end of the talk. I want to say thank you very much. Again, I'm, I'm Tyler Bell, and uh, that's the show. I'm happy to take some questions. Any questions on my ramblings? Um, so it's a beta service, no, it's an alpha service now. Um, we are, and really the point I was making is that we are one of several that are, that are doing this and, and, you know, without making any formal product announcements, I would be surprised if you didn't see something like this formally from us shortly. Right, so the question was, um, uh, how we, what's the authority list for POI in places? And Factual makes its own, so that's, that's the other part of our business, is actually creating that data set. Other questions? Yes, in the back? Right, so the, the question is, uh, well, the, the, the preliminary point was that working with probe data is problematic, and then given, given that, and given OSM's attitude towards inputting uh, programmatic or machine-learned content, uh, how's that gonna work out for OSM? Um, so one, one thing I think you'll see is, is a stack that takes individual data points, either as, uh, 
either as from a single source or basically sort of think of it as like probe data as a service and it will ingest probe data and then it will output vectors. And so that's a business in itself. That's a, pr a product platform in itself. And so I wouldn't expect probe data to find its way into OSM, but derivative data that's been created off of significantly dense probe data, I would. And, and, and frankly, there's, if you think of all the automotive folks that have not just mobile phones now as consumers, but also actually embedded in the vehicles, um, uh, you know, they are now have all the inertial data as well, and so what you're, what, you're, what you're going to see is a trend towards probe data becoming increasingly rich and increasingly dense. Any other questions? Yes? Thank you. Um, so the, the question was, um, all of this relies on actually seeing the data coming through one's pipelines. Um, how, does this, uh, um, how does this meet with uh, increasing expectations of privacy? Uh, if I, hopefully I, I paraphrase that correctly. Uh, the privacy angle is a hugely important one. I think it's another you know, 30 minute talk minimum. Um, so I didn't intend to skip it, but what I do wanna say is that Generally what Factual does when we work with our partners uh, is that they give us data, this user location data, we process it and then we give it only back to them. And so there's an advertising body called the NAI which gives guidelines about what you can and can't do with this data. And generally the rule is, there's all kinds of rules obviously, but the main one is don't break consumer expectations and give consumers a way out. So it used to be that individuals were tied to data and identifiers intrinsically. It still is. That's our SSID. It's our email address. In the world of mobile data, we now have the mobile device uh, and then the mobile uh, device identifier uh, and then the, the user on the other side of the device. And the user can slice that chain wherever they want. Um, so that, that's a long way of saying that uh, any company that breaks consumer expectations or does a poor job of, of uh, managing user location data will find themselves out of business very quickly. Um, but it's also a way of saying that this data is valuable without having any user IDs associated with it. So even if you have timestamps and high, high precision lat longs, collectively it be, it's an incredibly rich and incredibly powerful data resource, although the IP and the privacy issues are a further conversation. I think that's my time up, folks. So thank you very much for sharing this with me today. I'm grateful for your being here. Thanks.